I invite you to pray with me, please. Gracious God, I thank you for this day, for this occasion to gather around your word in this place with this people. And as we do, God, I pray that you, during this time of preaching and listening and hearing and receiving, that you would bless me with the words that would be pleasing to your ear and beneficial to our lives, that you would open all of our ears and our hearts to receive the word that is pleasing to you, that it would find a home in our hearts and bear much fruit in our lives when we leave this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Once upon a time, there was an old woman, poor, shabbily dressed, with no place to lay her head each evening. Every day, she would knock on the doors of the homes of her tiny village, hoping that someone would take her in and give her shelter. Alas, she was always unsuccessful. And so every day, at the end of the day, would climb the hill just outside the village wall and lay down to rest under the shade of a mighty tree. One particular day, after another fruitless attempt to find lodging, as she sat on the hill overlooking the village, as the last light of the setting sun colored the sky, she noticed something or someone she had never seen before. A young man Tall, handsome, well-dressed in a long black coat had entered the village. He was a stranger, a newcomer, and she knew that he would be needing lodging as night was coming upon them all. And she felt pity for him. She wanted to say, it's no use seeking lodging here. I've tried over and over again, and no one has had any room. And yet she watched as the young man went to the first door, a door that she herself had just knocked upon less than an hour earlier. And she watched as the door opened, and after a brief moment, the man disappeared inside. Well, all night long, she tossed and turned. She couldn't sleep. She couldn't rest. Who was this stranger who had succeeded in receiving what she had so long failed to obtain? When the first light of morning dawned and the man emerged from the house, she hurried down the hill as as fast as her old legs would carry her. And she went up to the man and said, How did you do it? I've been trying and trying to be welcomed into homes unsuccessfully. And here you are, a stranger, on the first attempt, finding lodging. And he said to her, what is your name? And she said, my name is Truth. And he said, well, Truth, I don't know why you've not been welcomed into homes. But... My name is Story, and why don't today we try seeking lodging together? You can hide within my coat, and when people welcome me into their home, they will welcome you as well. Stories. Stories are powerful because they allow us to receive truth that would otherwise be difficult, uncomfortable to receive. They allow us to face realities and confront things that otherwise we would be unwilling or unable to do. And there's a wonderful example of that in the Old Testament. King David, you might remember, was guilty of committing a crime or at least an ethical violation. He needed to be reprimanded, needed to be made aware of this violation. And his friend Nathan could have told him 
confronted him with the facts of what he had done. But instead, you remember what he did? He told him a story. He told him a story depicting the very violation that David himself had committed, and it was through the story that David was able to see and recognize and come to terms with the errors of his way. Stories have the ability to allow us to see things that otherwise we would be unable to see. Not only can stories help us see truth, though, stories convey a truth of their own. And the truth that stories convey is not dependent upon the factual accuracy of the details in the story. Let me say that again. Stories convey truth that is not dependent upon the factual accuracy of the details of the story. Sound like a contradiction? Well, think about proverbial paradigmatic grandfather, right? We know proverbial paradigmatic grandpa. He sounds something like this, doesn't he? When I was a boy, we used to walk to school barefoot in the snow, uphill, <laughs> both ways, backward. I shared that at 8 o'clock, and after service, someone said, well, in our family, Grandpa also carried a bucket with one cold biscuit in it. <laughs> now, is that factually true? Did Grandpa literally, factually, accurately walk uphill to school and uphill home from school? But does the story from Grandfather's childhood convey truth? that he was more impoverished than the grandchildren he's telling this story to, that he overcame much in his life to get where he is today? Absolutely. You see, stories convey truth that is not dependent upon the factual accuracy of the details. On the way home from vacation this week, I was in Michigan for two weeks, our annual pilgrimage up to our cottage. On the way home, we listened to a wonderful book as a family on audiobooks. Highly recommend it for all ages, I've, the, great, the one and only Ivan. The one and only Ivan. It's an animal story. And in the story, there's an old elephant named Stella who loves to tell stories to the other animals in their cages. And Stella has a great line that fits right in with the sermon. She says, I always tell the truth even though I confuse the facts from time to time. But isn't that true, though? There's truth in stories that are not dependent upon the factual accuracy. Stories are powerful, and so it's no wonder that Jesus told so many stories in his ministry. Here at Central Christian Church, over the, the past several months here in 2014, we've been taking a closer look at Jesus' life. We began in the wintertime looking at the beginning of his life in ministry. As we moved into Lent, preparing for Easter, we focused on the end of his life, his final seven days. After Easter, we focus now in these great I am sayings of Jesus from the Gospel of John. I am the way, I am the light, I am bread, and so on. And now as we continue to move through summer, we're going to focus on the, the stories of Jesus. They're called parables, and Jesus didn't invent them, but in my mind, he perfected the use of them. A parable is a story that's intentionally highly symbolic, meaning that the, the details of the story are meant to signify something else, which allows us, you and I, the reader, the hearer, to enter into the story at different ways, different places, at different times of our lives. The parable as a genre, a story, was often used in comparison, as a way of making comparisons from one thing to another. And so the way it would work is that a teacher would have some something that they wanted to convey to the student, but it was complex or, or difficult to, to, to put one's arms or head around. And so the teacher would employ the use of a story to compare this concept with something from the person's life to which they could relate. The function of a story to help convey truth. And Jesus, as we said, 
perfected the use of this. And today, for our scripture reading, we hear the first parable that he told. The very first one comes to us in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then again, verses 18 through 23. It's called the parable of the sower, not sower, but sower, the parable of the farmer. And I invite you, as you hear this, to notice the ways that Jesus is making comparisons and how one thing may stand for something else. Here is the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and went down by the sea. And such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the crowds stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables. And he said, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some of the seed fell on the path, but the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, but the thorns grew up and choked it. Other seed fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Here then, Jesus went on to say, the parable of the sower. Whenever anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the hearts. These are the ones sown on the path. As for those sown on rocky ground, they hear the word and immediately receive it with joy. But because they have no root, they only endure for a while. Then when trouble or persecution comes on account of the word, immediately they fall away. As for those sown among the thorns, they hear the word, but the lure of wealth and the cares of the world choke the word and it yields nothing. And as for those sown on good soil, they hear the word and understand it and indeed bear much fruit, a hundredfold, sixty, and thirty. The word of God for the people of God. It's a good story, isn't it? Begins with a sower, a farmer, who's meant to be who? God, Jesus, the divine figure. And that farmer, divine farmer, sows the seed, the starburst. And that's meant to be the Word, the Word of God. And that seed falls on different kinds of ground, which is meant to be us, you, me. We are these different types of ground. And the parable says that some of us are just not ready to receive the word. So our hearts are hard. And so when the word comes, it bounces off of us and falls to the ground and is eaten up by something. It's gone. Others of us, the parable says, are are like shallow soil. These are the people who are on fire for God 100%. Fully rely on God as long as things are going my way. Over-eager believers. They believe that God is there to do their will and not vice versa. And so when cancer comes or the loved one dies or the job is lost, they give up because God in their mind failed on God's end of the bargain. Then there are those in the thorns. They may be sincere about belief and about a lifestyle that embodies fruit. And yet there's a temptation, a sneaky temptation, to worship man-made altars. And you know, anything can be a man-made altar. Career, income, possessions, relationship, political preferences. (laughs) Anything that we obsess about controlling can turn around controlling us. And when that happens, the God in us is choked out of life. And then, of course, there is good soil. These are the ones who hear the word and understand it, accept it, and then live their lives in accordance with it. Now, I would suggest that when we hear this parable, our desired inclination is to to camp ourselves out right here and say, wow, thank goodness we're over here. Thank goodness we, we don't have to thank you, God, for not making me like those people over there. 
I don't have to do that. I'm, I'm safe and sound over here. But there's always a, a cautionary note to stories of Jesus about presuming to be one place forever. Even the people here, remember, have a lot of work to do to stay there. For me, I think this parable reminds us that we can be in any one of these points at any given time in our lives. Any time that we pick and choose the parts of Scripture that we cling to and disregard and dismiss the stuff that makes us uncomfortable, we are guilty of being that rocky path with a hard heart and not really receiving the Word. And we can deal with that shallow soil when we're in the pit of the valley and it's been one thing piled on us again and again and again. It can be, can be easy to say, all right, God, come on. <laughs> I'd like, I'd like a little bit of my will being served right now. And, and, and it's, it's sneaky being over here in these temptations to worship things other than God in God's place. You know, it's one thing to say something like, and it's easy to do, to say something like, I need to work this double shift or this triple shift, or I need to be spending all my time at the office because if I didn't do this, who would be, who would be providing for my family? That's easy to say. And maybe some value to that, some value. But as spiritual people, we say, look, we have to say this. Who's asking us to do that? Is God asking us to do that? Or are we asking ourselves to do that? The line between man-made altar and real altar, sometimes blurry, tough to figure out. And then, of course, there are moments when we uh, are, are that good soil, and we are generous, are generous, and give with the expectation of giving more without reservation. To me, this parable reminds us that we can, we can oscillate between these things at different points in our lives. Someday we may find ourselves here and other days here, and, and hopefully sometimes we'll see ourselves here and we'll, we'll work hard to stay there. But the main point of the parable, and this is where we'll close today, is this. Of all the time that this parable spends talking about the different kinds of ground, the real focus of the story is the farmer. Is the farmer. Because think about this. What kind of farmer takes the very best seed and dumps it in the weedy, thorny ground? And what kind of farmer takes the very best seed and throws it on the gravel path? What kind of farmer takes the very best seed and scatters it in all directions, knowing full well that there's a better than 50% chance that half of it's going to be washed away in the rain or eaten up by birds? What kind of farmer does that? A foolish one? A lackadaisical one, a reckless one, an ignorant one, or a loving one, a generous one, a stubborn one, who's so committed to spreading the seed that he will go out again and again and again and again and throw it out there on the off chance that this time might be different. This time might be different. Wherever you may be, whatever ground you may be in, the good news is that we worship a God who will come find you, who will come find you, and will pour out love on you because you're worth that much to the farmer. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for loving us and for finding us no matter what ground we may be standing on. And may God, our hearts be open to receive that word and that love whenever, however, wherever it comes. In your name we pray.